Hello, my name is Amy Limpetlaw, and I am the head librarian at the Boston University School of Theology Library. The library has sponsored this series of video interviews of faculty members of the School of Theology. Our goal is to showcase, through these interviews, the current work of our faculty authors. Each video runs around 20 to 30 minutes and focuses on a recently published book by the faculty member. We hope these interviews will serve to introduce you to the remarkable work going on at the School of Theology. Enjoy. Well, my name is Sam Needham, and I'm a third year MDiv student here at Boston University School of Theology. And today I'm sitting down with Dr. John Hart, who's a professor, the professor of Christian ethics here at the School of Theology. And uh, we're going to be talking about Dr. Hart's book, Cosmic Commons uh, Spirit, Science, and Space. So thanks so much, Dr. Hart, for being with us. Thanks so much for doing the interview. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Um, so uh, in, in Cosmic Commons, um, the uh, the basic argument of the, of the book is to take on a thought experiment in which um, extraterrestrial intelligent life uh, is, um, has made contact with a capital C with uh, human life on Earth, and uh, you expound some of the, the ethical, religious, um, scientific, and, and maybe above all spiritual implications of that. Um, maybe you want to say a little bit more about the nature of, uh, of the argument in the book. Okay, <clears throat> it's um, basically that we should think about the possibility of contact between terrestrial intelligent life and extraterrestrial intelligent life, and that um, <clears throat> since there are people who claim it has already happened, <clears throat> or and who might be considered credible witnesses, is a term used in a court of law for other kinds of things. <clears throat> it would be good to look into this and to think about it if we really want to understand how it might affect us or project how it might affect us uh, spiritually, scientifically, sociologically, and so on, uh, to think of it as if it has already occurred or will soon occur. And so that's the general attack of the book. I, and if we think about it, Earth is approximately four and a half billion years old. The universe, the latest estimate is 14.2 billion years old. So the universe as a whole is three times the age of Earth. And so if it is the case that there are intelligent beings on other planets or on other solar systems, <clears throat> uh, on other galaxies, whatever it might be, that if the evolution of life uh, proceeds much along the same lines and the same time period, uh, Earth was a billion years old before life, the most primitive life first emerged, and it's been a long journey since then. Uh, <clears throat> that there might well be intelligent beings elsewhere who could be actually uh, several billion years older than we are. And who knows what kind of technology they might have developed um, and what kind of spirituality they might have. And so that's, um, <clears throat> it, it can be mind-boggling or mind-expanding mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and not mind-threatening. Right. Uh, they might, for example, have developed a maybe not ever departed from a communal society, much as was present, for example, in, in the, what's now the Americas with the Indians who are here and Africa and other places throughout the world. They were very communal societies. They weren't, didn't have private property. They believed in the well-being of the community as a whole. <clears throat> so what happens if they have that and they are well ahead of us technology, technologically and, and so forth that they, it might make us rethink our own historical departure from that uh, communal ownership and forcing it upon other people, Europeans, when they arrived at places because private property they thought was a superior sign of civilization, mm -hmm. um, which is very debated. Uh, <clears throat> but in any case, that could be an impact in terms of our social arrangements. And then the spiritual, again, uh, the theology, we have so many different theologies here on earth, even among a single religion, Christianity. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure how many denominations there are now, and Catholics and Methodists and Episcopalians and Lutherans and so forth, uh, let alone Hindus, Baha'i, 
uh, Muslims, Jews, uh, so many different ways of thinking. So will beings on other places, intelligence, have evolved, developed socially, however, uh, in terms of a unified spirituality, <clears throat> that might, might be a possibility too. So uh, in that sense, when atheists claim, well, we're going to evolve beyond religion, mm-hmm. um, I don't think we will evolve, my own thinking, evolve beyond spirituality, a spiritual sense of who we are and what our relationships would be to the being of the universe, the spirit of the universe, who, who started the initial creative process and, and continues today. Uh, so we might develop, uh, I think, one of the points I make is there is, oh, and atheists are claiming that, well, we're gonna, we will evolve beyond the need for, the need for religion and spirituality, as I did and as my parents did and so forth, <clears throat> projecting upon everybody else their particular journey. Um, I theorize that it could just as likely go the other way, <clears throat> that we evolve into a higher form of humanity, which is a, a greater spiritual sense, which I would think would be beyond institutionalized religion uh, because we can't all get together, Hindus and Catholics and Methodists and <clears throat> Buddhists and so forth, uh, by taking just one of those and saying, this is the religion, but rather what do we share in common, which is a spirituality. And we might well go beyond, uh, dare I say, even evolve beyond institutionalized religion into more of a sense of the, the divine spirit and the spirit that's in, in all of us. <clears throat> in In much of your career, including in uh, your book Sacramental Commons, um, which the Cosmic Commons sort of builds on, on ideas that you put out in that book, you have, you have made it very much your, your trademark to integrate uh, social, cultural, theological streams into a, a consciousness of praxis. Um, and, and certainly Cosmic Commons is no, is no different. You, one, one of your main goals is to take both the deep thinking about spirituality that you were just mentioning, but also um, very, very close attention being paid to ethical considerations, especially as they're elaborated even at the most official levels. The, you take UN documents, you take um, court testimony and, and so on, and you take, so you take the spiritual data, the ethical data, um, the data of, uh, of ETI and contact, um, as, as part of the thought experiment, and you, you weave them into um, one perspective on how to go about living in the world. Um, how is it that you, that you um, go about maybe coming up with this, this integrative praxis uh, consciousness? Well, it, <clears throat> the two things most closely related to me are social justice and ecology. That's why I write about socio-ecological praxis ethics in my term. So uh, people have tried to niche me, so to speak, into ecology. I'm the, I'm the go-to person for ecology in the Boston Theological Institute. I get students from all different schools. But I've always linked social justice with that. Uh, my dissertation at Union Theological in New York was on Latin American theology of liberation. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I've been a long-time worker for justice in different groups in the United States. Uh, from farm workers to African-American human rights to Indian, Native American, or Native peoples uh, human rights. So I think they're inextricably intertwined, and you can't have one without the other. Uh, the ecological impacts of global warming, for example, now the oceans are rising, who is most impacted? Well, the island nations, which are now going underwater, <clears throat> other people living in coastal areas. Um, and as the seas continue to rise, it's going to impact a lot more. Uh, but I think those are, are very closely tied together. If there is no ecological well-being without social justice, and there is no social justice without ecological well-being. So I just began to look at that on then a, a cosmic scale. Uh, what might extraterrestrial intelligent beings have come to be? And I, I think the best anybody could do is we, we project from who we are and what we would like us to be in the future, what we hope we would be in the future, what we envision for ourselves uh, as humankind. And say that others perhaps have gone through similar kinds of evolution development, including social evolution as we have, and have come to some place beyond where we are currently. A world without war, for example, would be a nice thought. A world where everybody has a sufficiency of, of food, clothing, shelter, medicine, and so on. So it's just a matter of taking that, what I've been working with, as you mentioned, uh, 
for decades and then thinking about it in terms of other beings. Uh, it struck me that when <clears throat> some people say, well, we, when we colonize another planet, we're going to do it differently. We're not going to wreck that planet the way we've wrecked Earth in mm -hmm. terms of the pollution and so on. And we're going to treat people better than we're treating them on, on Earth. And so my thought was, why wait? <clears throat> if we know what we should be doing, why are we going to wait until we go someplace in space and set up the perfect planet there when we could be taking steps right now to, <coughs> excuse me, to bring it about here? And so what I suggest is a, a dialogic relation that could take place, both as we are here and as we project what we would like to be in space, such that the, the future informs the present. Our ideal world influences what we do today to help us change, and what we do today then helps bring about a better world in the future. Yeah, the, you, you mentioned the, the sort of as-if imagination of not only, uh, as so it is so popular in science fiction, uh, the dystopian future in which mm -hmm. we project what could go the most wrong with the systems that we have now and we should learn back from that projection about how to change society what and you say well why can't we do the same thing with a utopian society mm -hmm. literally utopia meaning no place but the implication being that the utopia is the ideal that we can all commonly uh, pursue and, and an elaboration of our best selves that we can pursue yes I maybe follow up on that uh, a utopia uh, no place, people usually use that in a sense of that's in a fantasy, it's in a dream that'll never happen. But it can also mean no place in the sense of there's no place like this now. Mm -hmm. We think this is the place that this, we should have, so that's our, our vision for the future. And so yes, it's utopia in the sense there's no place like that, but it's not always going to be utopia if we gradually try to realize, make approximations of the ideal place in history. Mm -hmm. And, and speaking too of, uh, of, of the ways in which you, you imagine these things, you're very attentive to uh, popular culture as well as, as, as um, popular data and, and perceptions of things. And you've mentioned at several points um, the uses of science fiction in movies like Avatar, uh, about, uh, which was very popular a few years ago, about the, the idea of contact with a, another species, another intelligent species, in which things really do go sort of disastrously, and that humans reenact um, the Western colonial um, attitude that, that Europeans in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries of the era, the era of colonization uh, enact. Um, and I wonder whether uh, now, now this, this movie's just come out recently, uh, the Interstellar, the Christopher Nolan film about um, the idea that we have to escape Earth uh, because we've done so poorly here, we have to, to get into space. It, it strikes me that, that the, the, the argument of this book speaks directly to that film and, and says, why would it be the case that, that we spend our time um, imagining only what could be done in space better than we've done here, without saying, why can't we make it better here right mm -hmm. now? Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> one of the inspirations for the book I mentioned is Stephen Hawking's comment that uh, <clears throat> we have to get, again, build a base on the moon and colony of Mars because we're going to destroy Earth in the next 20 years, he said. <clears throat> and I said, well, shouldn't we do, be doing something here? And who gets to go if we do save some of us and, and so on? So I, th I think that's, um, it's to think the way we would like envision what we would like it to be here and work toward that instead of going elsewhere. That was one of Hawking's quotes too. He said, uh, to my mathematical mind, yeah. <laughs> there are intelligent <laughs> beings in space, <clears throat> but we shouldn't contact them. Hmm. We should shut down SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence in Mountain View, California, because we don't want them to know we're here, because they have likely destroy their planet the way we are destroying ours, right, right. which is a very negative and anthropomorphism on the aliens. <clears throat> uh, and I, again, I say, why, first of all, project that on them, they don't have to necessarily be following the same way we went. But what about the people left behind, if we're going to save a handful of us on however many rocket ships go into space? Uh, that means that the vast billions are going to be on Earth that's <clears throat> being destroyed, and maybe by some of those very people who will escape uh, to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So to, to see this, <clears throat> our present task is to not only say, well, at least it'll be better in the future when we, some of us escape, but rather, why don't we start changing things now? That we, we have that as a possibility. If we really take seriously issues like global warming, impacts on the planet, and social justice. 
how many people go to bed hungry at night or without medical care mm -hmm. and, and shelter and so forth. That that's, <clears throat> that's something we can work on now. Uh, that's one of the points of Jesus in the Last Judgment story. I was hungry, you fed me, I was thirsty, you gave me a drink, and, and so on. Talking about the very fundamental needs uh, that we have and that we should be helping out those who are uh, deprived of them so that they can have those. Mm -hmm. So make Earth better as we're dreaming about starting anew someplace at some distant point. Uh, let's, let's do it now and not just wait for the future. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the substance of the book is, is both on a creative um, and, uh, and, and highly interpretive uh, move towards a very concrete practical project for Earth. And um, so the, the bulk of the book is dedicated to laying out your arguments and, and, and uh, elaborating exactly the visions that we, that we could avail ourselves of to make uh, the world and the, the cosmos um, more attuned to the spirit. But it seems also that um, at least some of the, at, at a sort of a meta level, some of the importance of the book is opening up a new uh, conversation and dialogue about the, the ability of academics to talk openly about uh, extra, extraterrestrial intelligent life. Um, and maybe you want to say a little bit more about um, the, sort of your quest to, to make this a more open and honest uh, dialogue in the academy and in mm. the popular <clears throat> imagination. Well, there's a, a fear among some people, some academics. Some people have gotten fired for suggesting this topic. Uh, I know someone on campus here was concerned that they would be fired if they even spoke about what they had actually seen mm -hmm. <clears throat> at one point. So um, I suggest, to use a term that's used in other contexts, that they come out of the closet, mm -hmm. so to speak. <clears throat> I also, uh, I'm not sure if I used the book in the book, but that, that saying that's in the, in the public transportation or on the streets, see something, say something. Mm -hmm. So if you have seen something, you know, start out maybe with a close friend that, uh, or a family member that uh, you hope or you know would not ridicule you or, or uh, tell other people about that, that person actually believes in UFOs mm -hmm. in a derogatory way. Uh, I suspect, I've just met so many people when, I, when I've spoken places that they do not say something at the meeting, but then they'll quietly come afterwards and say, you know, this happened to my father, this happened to my friend, or this actually happened to me, um, but I don't, I'm afraid to say anything because people will laugh at me and so forth. I suspect there are a lot of people out there who if they sort of start this underground movement, which need not be underground, but because of the fears that they would have about professionally and about the family and so forth, uh, to gradually spread the word, maybe have a study group, talk about a book like Cosmic Commons or another book, it could be a fiction book, uh, that focuses on these themes and say, uh, what do you think about that? <clears throat> what I suggest too is that it's not a matter of belief. I think that's a very erroneous question. Do you believe in UFOs or do you believe in extraterrestrial <coughs> intelligence? Belief is a, is a metaphysical character, a category. In, in materiality, in the material world in which we live, um, we don't say, do you believe that you're sitting in the School of Theology now? Right. Uh, I mean, you pretty much know where, where we are. That's right. uh, it's really that you know that. And then, or do you think, do you think that maybe uh, tomorrow the professor will spring a surprise test on you? So you think about that as a possibility. It might not happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't say, I believe that's going to happen. Well, or I don't believe it will happen. That's, you're, you're shifting kind of ways of thinking there. So I think people should get beyond <clears throat> using the word belief. Do you believe in UFOs? Rather than the possibility, that could be either yes or no. Do you think that uh, there are extraterrestrial <clears throat> intelligent beings who control some of the, the craft that are seen yeah, in the skies? Uh, if you know it, of course, if you've had an experience, that, and it's not either belief or knowledge, it's, uh, or belief or thought, it's, it's knowledge. Mm -hmm. I, I can't deny what my eyes have seen. Um, so I, I really want people to shift that category too and not, not worry about belief. And then you can have conversations, you can look at uh, works of fiction or, or, or works of fact and, and uh, discuss them. What do you think about this? What do you think about this idea or that idea? Instead of do you believe that was true or do you not believe it? Well, you should consider this is something that we're talking about. That's a material being, it's not some speculative transparent being floating in the skies or whatever else. Right, like this right. is something that can be actually established. You, know, you mentioned Dr. Hart um, at, at one point in the book, 
sort of an historical outlay of uh, the line of thinking that you're doing and, and you talk a little bit about um, some of the some of the friction at times but also sometimes the the good the the, the good and s syncretic relationship between institutions and communities of faith and thinking about the universe as greater than and you talk about um, three large displacements sometimes that happen within the church and religious organizations and sometimes um, in tension with them you talk about heliocentrism darwinism and and extraterrestrial considerations um, where do you see yourself in in that trajectory and how do you see uh, cosmic commons playing into that sort of historical widening of uh, the human frame of reference of the universe. I think that <clears throat> there have been two displacements so far. Uh, the first one, of course, was uh, the solar system when Copernicus and Galileo said, where our little planet is circling a, a single star in the vast universe. Uh, if you thought everything circled around the Earth, then, I mean, it was obvious to you, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything seems to be circling the Earth. And, Humankind, of course, we're the top dog mm -hmm. on Earth, the most intelligent, and, and with our tools, the most powerful. Uh, all of a sudden, to be told that the whole universe is not revolving around you. In fact, you're revolving around one star mm -hmm. in the vast universe. Like, that's really, can be in some ways, and <clears throat> it was in some ways very traumatic for people. It's like your worldview is literally, is, in a number of ways, not only a way of thinking, but where you are in the world itself is, <clears throat> has changed dramatically. <clears throat> and people finally accepted that the evidence was just so overwhelming. Well, at least we're the we're a unique creation of God with the only intelligent species and so forth. And so we're still on top, at least on Earth. And then, and then Darwin comes along and talks about evolution by natural selection. Uh, it's wait a second. I mean, I came from apes. You know, it's, that's kind of hard for me to accept. Uh, I come from a lesser, in that ph philosophical perspective, a lesser being. Uh, than the human being, and uh, if you finally get to accept that, some people still haven't. Uh, that's the second way of reevaluating our place now on Earth, and of course by extension into the cosmos. So it would be another one. So we're down to okay, yes, we evolved, but we're the most intelligent species, uh, and. Uh, it may be thinking cosmically. Some scientists say this is the only place where life evolved. Some religionists say the same thing. They don't want to acknowledge that they are not the very pinnacle of what's left that is, uh, as a species. <clears throat> then if another uh, an intelligent being comes along who obviously has far advanced technology uh, from someplace else in space, and that's, that's the, that would be the third displacement. So far now it can, it can be that way in thought, if you start thinking about a third displacement and how would you handle it. I'm on a NASA committee that is uh, looking at it from the Astrobiology Institute, uh, what would be the impacts on society if life were discovered, even the most primitive life. That mm -hmm. Once you see the most primitive, if you assume evolution, then it could evolve to be as, intel as intelligent as us. And not only it could, but it might have already in many different parts of a billions of years older uh, universe. Mm -hmm. So I think starting to think about it beforehand, so it's not such a shock, Think about the possibilities and how might that be accommodated into our spiritual outlook, into our social ways of interacting with each other and so forth. Mm -hmm. that, that would make it less of a, a shock of a displacement. And now that it's out there, I mean, the, the earth going around the sun, that was just completely <clears throat> out of the blue if that could be used. Uh, <clears throat> and then evolution. But this, with all the science fiction movies, uh, all the studies going on and so forth, it would not be a complete shock, but maybe we've never thought about it in terms of my particular person or my society, what would be if it actually did take place, how would we react to it? Can we be open-minded about the future and uh, from that point? Yeah. We survived the first two. That's right. I think we could survive <laughs> the third one too. That's right. But it's getting worked out. You, speaking of the, the, the theology that, that underlies Cosmic Commons, um, you're, you, you do a very good job about laying um, a sort of a simple, if the word could be used charitably, a, a, a simple spirituality of a, a creator who um, instigates the cosmic singularity, the Big Bang, which, um, from which the universe comes. So that that spirit with a capital S or God is 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 creator, but is also imminent and transcendent at all times. Mm -hmm. and, and you parse out how it is that 
uh, reflections about the vastness and the grandness of the universe also drive us inward to see um, the beauty and, and the ethical obligations of, of human life. As Kant said, the, the, the proofs for God were the, the, the starry skies above and the moral law within. Um, how do you see um, not only the incorporation of, of considerations about extraterrestrial intelligent life, but also the, the ethical imperatives of society and the ecological concerns of the world, how do you see these playing into a spirituality of an imminent and transcendent spirit? Well, they're all integrated, as I mentioned before, the ecological and the social justice aspect, too. Um, and I mentioned about the last judgment story, so Jesus brings them all together, that God is among the least of the brethren, least of the, of the humans. <clears throat> uh, so I think it can, knowing that there are, if we do know that there are other people at some point, uh, and I use the word people in a generic sense, of course, uh, intelligent beings from elsewhere, <clears throat> I think that it, it is really by integrating those in community and seeing how other people think about them, how we think about them, that all this does get get tied together because they're all so very much a part of who we are. In the in the Christian tradition, of course, the the ultimate symbol of the imminent and transcendent God is the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ and and the salvific message and and mission that Christ is on, ultimately to be redemptive of of human sentient life on earth. Um, and you mentioned uh, many considerations of uh, when we think about extraterrestrial intelligent life theologically, um, the question about a Christology on other planets from the Christian perspective. How is it that we can talk about Jesus' salvific role in other planets, or uh, to, to make that question more generic, how does God and how does spirit relate uh, not only creatively but redemptively in, uh, in, in worlds outside of our own? Okay, I think there's one presumption there, redemptively. Mm. Uh, we have a story about a fall from grace, and perhaps in other worlds this didn't happen. Mm. There's a very famous uh, Protestant uh, minister in England, Thomas Graham, if I remember his name right, who talked about the possibility of extraterrestrial life, and they might not have had an original sin. Uh, there's kind of a humorous one that uh, Théo de Chardin talks about, the Jesuit paleontologist, uh, uh, who was on the expedition that discovered the oldest human being at that time, Peking Man, it's called. It's about 1929. Uh, he talks about a, a newspaper article. He wrote this, his article at 1952, um, that not too long before that, I guess it was after Roswell, a Jesuit theologian at Fordham University said that <clears throat> uh, they could, they might not have had original sin, so we, if we shoot them, they wouldn't die, and I wonder, mm -hmm. first of all, why would you want to shoot them in right, fear? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but if they haven't committed sin, why would you want to do anything? Maybe you should really rather want to learn from them. And he said, I hope this was a joke when he read the story. Uh, maybe staying with him, he, uh, he theorized, and this didn't come out until years after he died, <clears throat> in a book of his writings, which the Vatican had forbidden him to do on any theological topics. He said he imagines if life can develop Similarly, on other places in the universe, uh, yeah, a whole series of this. If that is true, then he has no doubt that if we could lay some kind of a, a template on top of the, the cosmos as a whole, he has no doubt there would be a lot of flashing lights that indicated where intelligence existed. He just thinks it's with the immensity of the number of stars that it does exist elsewhere right, in, the, in the cosmos. Well, thank you very much. Dr. Hart, for, for your time and for your book. It's, it's a pleasure to read, and uh, it was a pleasure to sit down and talk to you today. Okay, thanks. And likewise on the conversation. Yeah.